Well, Job 32 is where we'll be this morning. If you have a Bible, please turn there with me. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one. You can collect it right as you walk out the doors on your way out. Got a brand new copy uh, for you. Uh, We're continuing in our series of the book of Job called If God is Good. You know, the Super Bowl was a little over a month ago, and it seemed like this year I heard more people than ever talking about watching the Super Bowl just for the commercials. Now, of course, that's not new. I mean, I hear that every year. It just seemed like it was more this year than maybe previous years. And yet, I didn't watch every single commercial. But there weren't really any commercials that I left thinking, oh, that was legendary. You know, that's one I'll never forget. Now, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years, there have been some commercials that that we're still talking about that have been so good, uh, so meaningful. They've connected with us in such a way that we still kind of remember those. Who can forget uh, 1979, what some have call, called the greatest commercial ever, where Mean Joe Green hobbled off the field after a, a very difficult game, you know, injury riddled, um, and a young man offers him his new, his, un, uh, his, his cold Coca-Cola, and Mean Joe Green receives it sort of gruffly and then turns around and says, hey kid, catch, and throws him his jersey. Or maybe 14 years later, some of you may remember in 1993, the the McDonald's commercial called The Showdown, in which Michael Jordan and Larry Bird, they play horse for Michael Jordan's Big Mac. And it's actually a multi-part commercial where at the end, it's, it's the, they shoot the ball over the rafters, off the backboard, nothing but net. And that's kind of how the commercial goes. When I was a kid, uh, in the early 80s, there was a commercial for E.F. Hutton and Associates. And you, some of you may remember this. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about if you're, I don't know, under 20 or 25. But the, the, the scene is you got two guys dressed in a dark suit, black suits. They're sitting at a table in a very upscale restaurant. And one of them says, hey, what does your broker think about this particular stock? The other man responds, well, my, my, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And everything just freezes. The commercial goes silent. Everybody leans in to listen to what this man will say. And, of course, he says the famous tagline at the end, uh, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Uh, what, what that means is there are some people in our lives, some people that we come in contact with, that their words just seem to have more weight. When they speak, you, you want to lean in and listen. So we're in Job 32 this morning. Uh, Job has 42 chapters, and 29 of those chapters that we've been looking at, they really involve three of Job's friends coming at Job on three different occasions. So we saw this last week. In three different cycles, each one of Job's friends will go and they will confront Job. And they all pretty much say the same thing. They say, you know, people who are sinful have bad things happen to them. You're having bad things happen to you, so you must be sinful. So just repent. And one of them even goes so low, maybe reaches the the lowest level of all, and says, you know, you lost your 10 kids and your wealth and your livelihood and your reputation, but actually you deserve much worse than that because you're such a wicked and evil person. Well, apparently, we just find out in Job 32, apparently sitting and listening to all of this was a young man during the whole time who hasn't said a word yet. His name is Elihu, and he's quite a bit younger than Job's friends, and so takes initially a posture of deference, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait this out. Um, but when he speaks, it's like we're more inclined to listen, not because what he says is so much better or wiser than Job's other friends, but he really has a flair for the dramatic. This guy is bombastic. He is loud. He is passionate. And so, you know, we're more inclined to listen to what he says. It's kind of like, please don't be offended by this. It's kind of like if three engineering students are sitting at a table discussing a problem, and a theater major comes in, and he is just like way over the top. Well, this is kind of the way that Elihu is, only we see some very important things from what Elihu has to say, namely, uh, the way that God speaks, the way that we find wisdom, and the way that God saves. So actually, uh, the way that we find wisdom is first, the way that God speaks is second, 
and the way that God saves is third. So we'll be in Job chapters 32 and 33, and I'll read select portions of each. But let's begin uh, with Job chapter 32 and verse 1. So these three men, Job's friends, ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Now, if you've read the New Testament, uh, you know that righteous in his own eyes is a very negative thing to say about someone. That is definitely a pejorative comment. Um, it can mean, the phrase can mean self-righteous. Uh, in other words, um, someone who looks down at others in a condemning way, someone who believes that he is morally superior to, to everyone else. Um, and in that sense, it would be very negative. But righteous in his own eyes can also refer to a man who's unwilling to admit his guilt, clinging to his innocence because he really doesn't believe that what's been brought before him is true and accurate. And the latter understanding, I think, is what's meant here. Now look at verses 2 through 5. Then Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. Now what's the first thing we notice about Job's friend Elihu? He's got an anger problem. This guy has an anger issue. Four times in five verses, we're told, he burned with anger. Now, here's the deal with anger. Anger is not always a sin. After all, God gets angry. See this uh, throughout the Scriptures. Jesus uh, gets angry. Now, this is a holy, righteous anger, pure anger we're talking about, but a real anger nonetheless. The Apostle Paul got anger, angry. Nehemiah got angry and started pulling out people's hair. This guy got really angry. And actually, God calls us to get angry. When innocent life is taken, when the helpless are oppressed, when women are abused, when young girls are trafficked, when injustice prevails, we ought to be angry about those things and do something about them. The problem is because we're sinful creatures who live in these fleshly, unglorified bodies, our anger is almost never purely righteous. There's usually some sinful motive in our anger. So it's okay for us to get angry, you know, in some situations. What matters is what we do with that anger. And here, Elihu's anger is partly righteous, but it's also partly unrighteous. Um, he's right in being angry about the way Job's friends have treated Job. They continually accuse Job of wrongdoing, but they've not produced any evidence that would show that what they're saying is correct. So Elihu's mad about that, and we can say rightly so. But Elihu's anger is unrighteous in that he seems to be personally slighted by all of this, by the ineptitude of Job's friends. But he waited to speak again because he was much younger than Job's friends, and he felt like it would have been disrespectful to jump in right away. But then he would speak. Look at verses 6 through 12. And Elihu the son of Barakel the Buzzite answered and said, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, Let days speak, and many years teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. It is not the old who are wise, nor the aged who understand what is right. Therefore I say, Listen to me. Let me also declare my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words. I listened to your wise sayings while you searched out what to say. I gave you my attention, and behold, there was none among you who refuted Job or who answered his words. So Elihu, you know, as, as we, we've seen here, he's, he's a bit of a drama queen, so to speak. He's, he's, you know, he gets very elevated what he says. Later on, he's going to say, I just can't hold my tongue anymore. My belly is like a wine that has no vent. In other words, if I don't speak, I'm just going to burst. I'm just going to bust in two. And then he'll say toward the end of chapter 32, he says, he'll say, I don't flatter anyone. I don't even know how to flatter anyone. If I did, God would immediately end my life. So we say, okay, it's a little melodramatic, 
Um, he says to Job's friends in verse 7, I thought while you, while you guys were talking, I should let you speak. After all, you've lived many more days than I have um, and experienced many more things. But the more you talk, the more I just couldn't stand it any longer. And I had to share my opinion as well. He's a little extra on his take, uh, with his take on things, but he's on to something very important here. Here's our first point. Neither age nor experience ensure wisdom. Wisdom is supernaturally granted by God upon desperate request. So we might think, and you know, generally speaking, the older you get, the wiser you should get because you experience more, you go through more. But what Elihu says is wisdom comes from God, and apart from God, what he calls the breath of the Almighty, there is no true wisdom. Wisdom is a gift of God that he imparts to those who humbly and desperately ask for. So, as Pastor Chris touched on so well last week, there are so many areas in our world, so many areas in our society, Western society, where what's touted as wisdom is actually foolishness. Wisdom is, is different than knowledge or intellect. You can know how machines work. You can know how to write code. Uh, you can know how to write curriculum. You can know how to design a bridge. Uh, but wisdom has more to do with how the heart works, how to live in a way that promotes freedom and human flourishing in a way that, that is in accordance with God's creative design. Now, why do we so desperately need wisdom? Because we are sinners. Uh, if you're in Christ, you are a redeemed sinner, but you are still a sinner nonetheless. So we carry around the baggage of the flesh, which means that our minds, our emotions, our wills are affected by sin. We don't see clearly. We have blind spots. We don't reason clearly. Plus, because of our sin, our default mode is to look out for ourselves to do what works best for us, which ultimately leads, tends to lead to disaster. So Elihu is arguing that Job's friends, they, they're older than he is, but they don't really understand how the heart works. They don't really understand how people live together in peace and harmony. If we want wisdom, he says, we have to plead with God for it. So if you want to know, if you want to know how to replace the alternator in your car, or fix the slice on your golf swing, or find that perfect chocolate chip cookie recipe, you can pray about it, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's always good to pray. But you might find more immediate results if you actually Google it, these things, maybe more immediately. However, if you want to learn to live, how, live at peace with your neighbor, if you want to understand how the heart works, if you want to understand the way of human flourishing, that is to say the best way to live, if you want to have an enjoyable relationship with your kids, if you want to see God's work in the world, that requires wisdom that doesn't come from a textbook. You can't Google it. It doesn't even come necessarily from life experience. That only comes from the breath of the Almighty. So we plead with God for it. We beg God to give us wisdom, and, and we avail ourselves of the means by which God pours out that wisdom. So Elihu believes that Job's friends have approached Job all wrong. They've relied on their own reasoning, and as such, verse 14, their speech has been empty. But in Elihu's mind, he's a young man who really gets it. So look at, verses, look at 33, chapter 33, verses 1 through 12. But now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. Behold, I open my mouth. The tongue in my mouth speaks. My words declare the uprightness of my heart, and what my lips know, they speak sincerely. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of God, the breath of the Almighty, gives me life. Answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Behold, I am toward God as you are. I, too, was pinched off from a piece of clay. Behold, no fear of me need terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy upon you. Surely you have spoken in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am pure without transgression. I'm clean, and there's no iniquity in me. 
Behold, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. Behold, in this you are not right. This is Elihu speaking. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. So Elihu says, look, I'm a man just like you are. I was made from the clay, fashioned from the dust, just like you are. And so listen to what I have to say. I know what I'm speaking here. He says, your other friends, those old guys, their their motives weren't pure. But listen to me. My motives are pure. My words come from a sincere heart. And then he says, you say that God is not speaking to you, but God has always spoken to his people. They're just not willing to receive it. He goes on to explain how that happens. Look at verses 13 and following. Why do you contend against him, saying he will not answer? He will answer none of man's words. For God speaks in one way, and in two, though man does not perceive it. And then he lays out those two ways. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings, that he may turn aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. So he says, one way that God speaks to man is by dreams, but you won't, you can't perceive. And then he goes on, verse 19, man is also rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones so that his life loathes bread and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted that it cannot be seen. His bones were not seen Stick out. His soul draws near the pit and his life to those who bring death. If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of a thousand, to declare to man what is right for him, and he is merciful to him and says, Deliver him from going down into the pit. I found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then the man prays to God and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy. He restores to the man his righteousness. He sings before men and says, I I sinned and perverted what was right, and it was not repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. So let me summarize what Elihu is saying here. After proclaiming how wise and insightful he is for being such a young man, Elihu says, you keep saying that God won't speak but you don't get it. You're older than me, but you don't get it. God actually has spoken to you. He speaks to us, he says, in two ways, through dreams and through suffering. Last week, I reached out to a friend of mine I hadn't spoken to in five years, and um, I'm sure that it came across as random to him. Um, He was a former staff member at another church, and I was kind of playing matchmaker a little bit, not relationally, but vocationally, I had heard about, or not heard, another friend of mine on, on one coast told me he was looking for an associate pastor, and I, my mind thought of this guy on the opposite coast who might be a good fit, so I reached out to him out of the blue, and uh, the first thing he said to me was, this is crazy that you reached out to me. I had a dream about you last night, and my first thought was, okay, that's a little weird for me. Um, since we haven't talked in five years, you'd be dreaming about me. Um, but we kind of left on odd terms, so I didn't say that to him. I said, was it a nightmare? And uh, he said, no, it wasn't a nightmare. He said, I just really had a hard time making sense of it. And then he said to me, and I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. He said, do you interpret dreams? And I thought, I, I don't know if he's being serious or not, but I said, well, that's not really my specialty, um, interpreting dreams. We don't do ourselves any favor, I think, by making too much of our dreams. In fact, last night, so so my sermon was already written, but I had to go in and add this part because last night I had a dream about being chased by a hippopotamus. I really did. And I don't know where this came from. Like, I don't, I'm never around hippopotami. I don't ever think about hippopotami. But I had this dream that this hippopotamus was chasing me. And Right when he, he opened its mouth, his mouth, you've seen you know, what that looks like. Right, he was scared, he was scared away by Scooby-Doo. <laughs> that was my dream. Now, make sense of that for me, why don't you? I have no idea what that meant, and I didn't spend a lot of time trying to discern it either. Um, 
Throughout redemptive history, we do uh, see God speaking to people in dreams. In fact, some of the most significant events in the Old Testament are brought about by God guiding His people through dreams. Genesis 20, God protected Abimelech, the king of Gerar, from sleeping with Abraham's wife, Sarah, by means of a dream. Genesis 28, God met Jacob in a dream. Genesis 31, the angel of God told Jacob to leave Laban and return to Canaan. In Genesis 37, of course, we know Joseph uh, has multiple dreams that foretell his rise to power. Then in Genesis 40, Joseph would interpret the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. In Genesis 41, the dreams of Pharaoh. In the New Testament, when Jesus stands at trial with Pontius Pilate, Pilate's wife warns him against having anything to do with Jesus because she has been informed of Jesus' innocence by way of a dream. Now the question is, does God communicate to us that way today? Well, it's a delicate matter, and I say that because we would never say that God can't communicate or warn somebody by way of a dream, uh, nor would we say, at least let me say we, nor would I say that He never leads people to saving faith to, to Jesus by way of a dream, particularly in those unreached and developing parts of the world where there is no gospel witness through the Timothy Initiative that we support. We sometimes hear about animists, witch doctors, spiritists, and even uh, Muslims being brought to faith in Jesus through dreams. So God can certainly get a hold of us by way of dreams. But with the completion of the canon of Scripture, the Bible, we have little reason to believe that dreams are kind of a normative way, a normative part of the Christian life. And listen to this, to the contrary... The New Testament so affirms the sufficiency of the Scriptures uh, in such a direct way and clear way for God's new covenant community that the, the covenant community is actually warned against putting too much stock in superstitions or dreams. So the long and short of it is don't put too much stock in your dreams. Let the authority, let your authority be the Scriptures in which we have what Paul says, the mind of Christ. Elihu, Job's friend, says that God speaks in dreams and, he says, through our suffering. Now, certainly, this last assertion is true, and I think we can even say a truth that extends through all generations and all eras, and that is God does speak to us in and through our suffering. Many of you have young, who have young kids, you know C.S. Lewis maybe primarily through the Chronicles of Narnia. Of course, you know, terrific, uh, amazing work that was made into a movie a few years ago. But before Lewis wrote the Chronicles of Narnia in 1950, he actually wrote uh, well, at least a dozen books before that. But in 1940, 10 years before, he wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. Some of you I know have read this. C.S. Lewis knew something about experiencing real devastating pain. He lost his mother when he was 10, which actually sent his father into an, such an emotional spiral that his father became very distant and emotionally aloof. Um, Lewis suffered from a respiratory disease as a teenager. He was wounded in World War I and then finally had to bury his beloved wife, Joy. And through all of this, he, he really chronicled his pain in the book, The Problem of Pain, and in it, he penned one of his most famous lines. He said this, Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. There's something about pain. There's something about suffering that brings us to our knees in such a way that we are more open to communing with God than ever. There's something about suffering that makes us more aware of God's presence than perhaps anything else in life. God even says, by way of the psalmist, the Lord is especially close to the brokenhearted. It's when our self-sufficiency is stripped away 
and we see how weak we really are, that we find ourselves more open to the voice of God than ever before. It is in our pain that God gives us a taste of His goodness and helps us to grasp just how sufficient He truly is. Now, it would be bad theology to say, well, in that case, we ought to desire suffering. And I had a professor in seminary who said that he prayed that God would bring him pain. And I never really understood that. I don't think that's good theology. But it is good theology to say, if I can sound like John Piper for a moment, don't waste your suffering. Lean in and listen in your pain to what God is saying to you as you rest in His Word and commune with Him in silence. Here's our second point. Pain is seldom punitive, but instead provides an occasion for unparalleled intimacy with God. Elihu was saying, look, look, the reason you're going through so much pain, God is punishing you. Your pain is punitive. You've done something wrong, and God has you on your back in agony. Well, we've already seen you know, throughout this book, that's not really how God works. Elihu was right in arguing that it's in pain that God speaks in a unique way, but he was not so right in saying that pain is punitive. If you're suffering right now, physically, emotionally, spiritually, don't miss an opportunity to commune with God in a unique and powerful way. In your brokenness, be still before the Lord and cry out to Him for His mercy. Let His love wash over you. Notice afresh how He carries you, how He loves you, how He delights in you. See how His power is made perfect in your weakness. Open your heart to taste and see that He is good. And He will do that. You will experience in a supernatural way the goodness of God. In other words, you will know a sort of peace and a joy that make no sense in light of your suffering. This is God's work. This is God's comforting presence. Elihu was right. God speaks loudly in our pain. But he was wrong in concluding that pain was always punitive, that pain is God punishing us. Verse 19, he says, man is rebuked with pain on his bed, with continual strife in his bones. This is the same old tired counsel that Job has received from his other three friends. And here Elihu comes along as this sort of innovative young voice, but it's the same old stuff. We know we suffer because we live in a broken world. We suffer because we live in a sin-cursed world. But even in that broken world, God is present and He is redeeming all things. In your pain, God is saying something to you. Now look at verses 29 through 33. Behold, God does all these things, twice, three times with a man, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be lighted with the light of life. Pay attention, O Job, listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Be silent and I will teach you wisdom. So one of the points that we made throughout this book, and of course we've been making it for years here, is that, at the, is that the individual stories in the Bible, for example, this story of Job, is not some isolated story about a man who lived in the ancient Near East some 3,000 plus years ago. That's totally disconnected from anything that came before or after. Job is actually a story that fits within a larger story. So often we go to the Bible and we, we look at it and we want to find those nuggets for how to live better. And I can't tell you the number of times as a teenager in youth group, I was encouraged. You know, what's the nugget here? What's the nugget that's going to help you obey God more? What's the nugget that's going to help you mortify sin more? And, and that's not, I mean, that's not 100% bad, but that's not the way to look at the Bible. Now, of course, the Bible is filled with wisdom. And the Bible, as I've already talked about, does show us a better way, the way of human flourishing, the way to live in accordance with God's creative design, the way that honors God. But the Bible's not a collection of how-tos. 
It's a single story about God's plan to redeem the sin-cursed world through His Son, Jesus. And it's not a story where the ending is yet to be determined or was ever in question. To the contrary, the ending of the story was determined by God before the story was ever written. All of creation, all of history has always been moving toward the ending that God has always had in store, even before creation. The fall of Adam and Eve didn't cause God to alter His divine plan. God did not think to Himself, oh, I never thought that would happen, and so He had to reverse course. That's not the way God works. His plan has always been the same, always been the same, since before creation, to redeem this broken world and to bring His people into that great celestial city on a new earth where they will enjoy complete and unfettered access to God Himself, where God will go and live with His people in total shalom forever. The great Reformed theologian, Dutch theologian Gerhardus Voss writes, there is an absolute and posited, or absolute end posited for the universe before and apart from sin. The universe as created was only a beginning. The goal was an absolute, perfect, ethical relation to God and a supernaturalizing of man and the world. In other words, when Adam and Eve were created, they were created without sin, but not without the possibility to sin. But the, but the end for which God has created the world is so that man will live forever with this God in perfect shalom in a state of being where he is no longer, it's no longer possible to even sin. That's what that supernaturalizing means. In other words, this story is not like Star Wars, where there's a constant question, which force will prevail in the end? The end has already been determined. It was never in question, not even before creation. God will bring, him, bring to Himself His people, those whom God has chosen. He will bring to saving faith, and they will forever enjoy Him for all eternity. Now, maybe you're thinking, what, is in the world, what in the world does that have to do with Job's chapter 32 and 33? Well, everything in the Bible points to that great ending and the one through whom God would bring it about, namely Jesus Christ. God's plan introduced in seed form in Genesis is pro progressively revealed throughout the Bible. And here Elihu, though he doesn't fully grasp it, he offers some clarity as to what's in store. He says in 33 verses 29 and 30, God does these things with a man that he may be lighted with the light of life. Suffering, pain, conviction, guilt, failure, disappointment, all of these things are meant to lead us to the light of life. Well, what is the light of life? In John 8, we read this. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have what? The light of life. Sound familiar to you? Of course it does. I just read that from Job 33. What Elihu doesn't fully realize is that the true light of life that God is leading people to is the one that God would one day send, Jesus the Christ. And that brings us full circle in this passage, which began talking about wisdom. There is a wisdom that seems right, but it's only foolishness in the end. There is a way that seems right, a way of salvation that seems right, but it's an empty set. It never delivers. The wisdom of the world says, and every religion of the world says, if you want to be right with God, you have to earn it. But Jesus comes along and says, if you are to be right with God, it's not about what you do. It's about believing in me. What Jesus offers is an acceptance by God that is apart from, not rooted in, our performance. 
Jesus claims to be the light that leads to life. Jesus doesn't say, I am a light. He doesn't say, I am a way. Jesus intends, intends to preempt all other lights to be the singular light, the light of the world. Now, it's exclusive in the sense that He is the only light, but it's inclusive in the sense that He is the light of the world, which is what propels us on mission to tell others about this light, the light of life through whom man can be reconciled to God. Jesus is the light of life. He is salvation from darkness. He is a salvation. He offers salvation through His life, death, and resurrection. Jesus marks the end then of our own self-salvation projects. Here's our final point this morning. Man's wisdom is a hamster wheel in the darkness. The light of Jesus frees us to enjoy life the way it was intended in a right relationship with God. You know what? I don't have any hamsters. I don't have any hippos either, even though I dream about them. Um, if you know what a hamster wheel is, the hamster gets on it and runs furiously but gets nowhere. This is, this is what every other religion of the world offers. You can run furiously as we've sung together, as Dave led us through. You can work our, work our fingers to the bone. Uh, you can do everything. You can get up earlier, and you can serve, and you can deny yourself, and you can give all your money to the poor. It's not going to get you anywhere in terms of your salvation. It's a hamster wheel in the darkness. But the light that Jesus offers, the light of life, the light that He actually is, is salvation by believing, not doing. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I actually think about this a lot, frankly. I have become fairly convinced that to-do to do list Christianity, you know, going to the Bible simply for what we need to do and not do, um, this notion that God will think kindly of me if I do the right things and never fall short, that my obedience is the key to unlocking His love and so on, it's actually crushing Christians. I really do think about this a lot. It's crushing Christians. I talk to so many people who though they would never say it in these words or perhaps articulate it in this manner, they're working so hard to either earn God's love or to pay Him back for what He's done for them. And they're worn out. They're overwhelmed with guilt. They're mad. They really are mad. Mad at God because in their estimation, they've been good, at least the good, as good as they can be. So why is this bad thing happening to them? Plus, they have the hardest time putting on humility, admitting they're wrong because that may jeopardize the way that they're viewed by other people and perhaps in their minds even by God. What will God think of them if they admit their own wrongdoing? So they live by the code of self-righteousness. I must be right and everybody else must be wrong. Can you imagine how exhausting this must be? Because deep down they know they're not always right, but you've got to put on that front. But this is the consequence of walking in darkness rather than following the light of life. This is the consequence of relying on our own wisdom rather than that wisdom imparted by the breath of the Almighty. In the darkness, there's only one message. You must do more. What you have done is not enough. If you are to receive God's approval, there's still a lot riding on you. That's the wisdom of the world. That's the message in darkness. But the light of life brings an entirely different message. He says, he doesn't say do more. He says what? It is done. It is finished. And speaking of light, God sees believers through the prism of the cross. Our sins and failures are hidden by the blood of Jesus, covered by the blood of Jesus. The spectacular sins and the everyday variety, all covered by the blood of Christ, and we are robed with Christ's righteousness. When God looks at the believer, he sees Jesus, and because when he looks at us, he sees Jesus, he fully and totally and forever accepts us. He loves us unwaveringly. We don't have to do anything to secure his blessing. It was secured for us by Christ himself. It's ours because of what Jesus done. The work of Jesus in imparted to us by faith, 
Are we saved by works? Yes, but not our own. By the works of another, by the work of Jesus Christ, who fully obeyed, satisfied the law and its requirements, all of it in its entirety. And his perfect record is ours by faith. The world's way of thinking, the mindset of those who are in darkness is, I must be enough. I have to do more. If I just do my best, I can pay for my sin. Those who are led to the light say, Heal us, Emmanuel. We long to feel thy touch. Deep wounded souls, to thee we fly. O Savior, hear our cry. And he does hear. All those who cry out to him for salvation, he hears, he delivers, he rescues, and he renews. He makes that which was dead alive. He turns chaos into beauty, all by his grace. Let's pray.